Hello everyone and welcome to the next video in the Burst Education series. Today we're going to talk about the levels of evidence, a common question and essential knowledge for anyone with a passing interest in evaluating the medical literature. Now a lot of you may already be quite familiar with the levels or the hierarchy of evidence, but bear with me because we're going to discuss some recent changes that most people are not aware of. So let's get straight into it. Our aim today is very straightforward, to understand what is meant by levels of evidence for clinical studies. Now this is a table that will be very familiar to a lot of people, or at least its contents will. It describes the classical levels of evidence as set out by the Oxford Centre for, Ev for Evidence-Based Medicine in 2009. Basically, you start with randomised control trials at level 1, moving down to non-randomised studies or cohort studies at level 2, through to case control studies at level 3, case series at level 4, and expert opinion which is not based on critical appraisal at level 5. Subdivisions of each level exist depending on whether evidence is based on a well-conducted systematic review of a number of similar studies, or whether it's based on one high-quality study alone. For example, level 1A evidence means it is based on a good quality systematic review of multiple randomized control trials. And we'll take a look at what makes a good quality systematic review and what heterogeneity is in a later video. Another caveat in this table is that levels can be downgraded for quality. So a randomized control trial with a high risk of bias would be downgraded to level 2, for example. Conversely, it is highly unlikely for lower level studies, such as observational studies, to be upgraded even if they are very high quality, because of the inherent bias associated with these types of studies. So if you're attending exams or interviews and are asked about levels of evidence, this is the table you would refer to. Now comes the interesting bit. There's been a lot of criticism of this method of grading evidence, principally that it's too rigid and lauds the randomized control trial as being the supreme king of study design, while in practice that is not always the case for certain types of research question. Moreover, there are problems even with well-conducted randomized control trials, and a common one is that inclusion criteria to randomized trials are often so stringent that the applicability of the results to a more generalized population is often called into question. Enter the new levels of evidence table from the Oxford CEBM, first published in 2011. Now, you might look at this in dismay, saying they've just made it 10 times more complicated, but again, bear with me. The thing to understand here is that they have very judiciously divided the table according to the type of question being asked. So if your question is an epidemiological one of how common the problem is, then randomized control trials are nonsensical. So your highest level of evidence would come from a simple survey or census. And remember, in old money, a survey or a census would, be, would have been down at level 4. If you're looking at diagnostic tests, then the top level evidence would be from systematic reviews of cross-sectional studies with proper reference standards. Again, something which previously would have come much lower down the evidence table. But the real difference and the real comparison to the old levels table comes in this section here. And I'll just highlight it to make it a bit easier. This looks at interventional studies that assess benefits and harms, which is the most common type of studies we are asked to conduct or evaluate. And here you see a similar trend compared to the previous table going from systematic reviews of randomized control trials down through to case series and mechanism-based reasoning. But the big difference is two things. First is that the single randomized control trial has been bumped down to level two. And alongside it, you have observational studies with dramatic effect, and that's a major change. So potentially an observational study with a very large effect could be considered to have as high an impact as a well-conducted single randomized control trial. The second thing is here, the top level of evidence, you have systematic reviews of randomized trials as before, but you also have N of 1 trials. Now that's a term which might be new to a lot of you. What's an N of 1 trial? Well, quite simply, it's exactly what it says. An N of 1 trial is a trial where there is only one participant. Sounds strange? Maybe, until you consider the fact that there is an ongoing trend towards patient-centered outcome research, for reasons we've previously alluded to, the problems with randomized control trials. Single patient trials, or individual patient trials as they're sometimes known, are multiple period crossover experiments comparing two or more treatments in an, in an individual patient, which allows you to identify the best treatment for that individual patient without worrying about inclusion criteria and whether there's a trial ongoing that asks the question your patient is interested in, etc. Obviously this may not apply to most surgical trials, but it's a very exciting change. And if you want to know more about N of 1 trials, 
there is a link to a paper at the end of this video. I'll also put the reference in the description below. Put simply, an individual patient trial allows you to assess and compare how a particular patient with all their individual circumstances and on their, all their particular comorbidities reacts to one treatment for a formally evaluated set period of time, followed by a period of washout, and then trialing the second treatment for the same period of time. Now, N of 1 trials are new, protocols can vary, but the key to it is that it is patient-centered. And therefore, for a particular patient, the outcome of that trial may be much more relevant than the outcome of a randomized control trial of the same two interventions. And that's why it's given such a high weightage on the level of, level of evidence table. However, the thing to remember is that an individual patient trial for one patient does not give you any idea of how those treatments might affect another patient. So just to gauge your understanding, let's look at a couple of examples. Now try to work them out on your own, but you can always refer back to the table to aid your memory. So the first is a prospective case series of 140 patients. What level of evidence would that constitute in the new table, assuming that this is a study looking at treatment benefits? That would be level four. Next, an N of one trial assessing potential harms for an individual patient. Of course, that would now be level one for that individual patient. Final example, a prospective observational study showing a dramatic benefit for treatment A versus standard therapy. And that, according to the new evidence table, would be level two, whereas on the old table, it would still only be a level four. I hope that gives you a brief understanding about levels of evidence. Remember that if you're asked the question about levels of evidence, most people will be familiar with the 2009 levels, and that is something you should certainly be familiar with. But the new 2011 table is, in my opinion, much more in keeping with modern day research practice and much more intuitive once you get used to it. So it's definitely something to be aware of. As previously promised, here's a reference to a paper explaining single patient N of 1 trials. And as always, keep up to date with the latest news from Burst on the website. And any questions, feel free to fire them across. Thanks for watching.